Let me start uh, by saying that 35% of the Latin American population uh, lives on less than $5 a day. According to a recent study from the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank, 70% uh, of the population in Latin America belong to the base of the pyramid. Uh, these are people that earn less than $10 a day. Base of the pyramid are made up of two segments. One is the poor, less than, they earn less than $4 a day, and the other one is the vulnerable group, earn less than $10. Traditional retailers belong to the base of the pyramid. Being a traditional retailer is not a, de a decision or a vocation, but a consequence. I'm sorry. In Latin America, the traditional retailers are mom and pop shops, corner stores, kiosks, street carts, and tenderos, as we call them in Latin America over three million in the region, and they are very powerful community, very useful for the community, and they need a lot of care. One retailer can influence over 50 families. Six out of 10 decided to be in this business for only two reasons, only two. First, unemployment and have easy access to low-cost food. And in the case of women, because of the need of working without leaving their children, 70% of the shops are owned by women or managed by them. So this is just the beginning of a story that is changing many lives in Latin America. Being a traditional retailer is a hard work, but it is harder to live with low self-esteem and giving up your career and your status as well. They, they feel like they, they haven't met their family needs. They are an association without any hope. They think that they really don't believe them in themselves. They themselves don't believe in anyone. Let's see what Mr. Ugaldi from Panama says. He's a retailer. When I started, nobody supported me. Nobody believed in me. I needed a lot of help to advance, and a very few gave me any. They don't trust the leaders or governors. They don't trust the financial institutions or the banking organizations because that the banks took away their houses just less than a decade ago. But what they require is hope. They need hope. They need a meaningful job and a meaningful life. And we are here with this program that I'm going to share with you to help them. Let's say what Claudia Rodriguez, another retailer from Peru, she's uh, 61 years old. When the owner of the shop wants to take over the shop, then he will do it, and I lose the only thing I have. These are the insights that call our attention in SAB Miller. This was the opportunity to create the 4E Camino al Progreso, Path to Progress program in Latin America um, that is des designed to untap the potential of these retailers through four steps. By improving their business skills, their life skills, their leadership skills so they can influence their community. This program is run in six countries in Latin America and is being replicated <coughs> this year in Africa, starting in four countries and expanding to 10 more. Um, the retailers go through a process of 12 weeks, and they learn about accounting, finance, marketing, sales, customer service, 
and they start building a business plan. And at the same time, they, are, they start building a life plan so they can find that balance. So at the end, they can become real leaders having that balance and then that sustainability and that potential of growth so they can impact the community and make a real social, social change. Um, our goal is to benefit 200,000 retailers by the year 2020. That is reaching, reaching around 10 million people. Um, we have committed an investment of $23 million to benefit the first 40,000 uh, retailers in the region. But we cannot do this alone. We definitely need partners to scale this that is already tested. We have been running the program for two years. You're going to see some of the results later on. And the 4E program is a case of inclusive growth and development. We are changing the lives of these people. We are empowering communities, communities for change, using the economic power of business. And in SAB Miller, we say that if we want our business to prosper and be sustainable, we need our consumers, our customers, and communities to prosper also. The retailers have a key role in society. First, because they provide the food for many people. They are helping thousands of families to overcome poverty. They are also key customers for the um, consumer goods industry. They are the main retail channel in developing countries. And they are also helping communities to survive and to develop. And they are the channel that can re re distribute resources in those very remote corners where these people are and that these people cannot access these imposing Latin capitals. They don't only sell products and services, they bring emotional and economic balance. They help each other. When they arrive in a community, they will enjoy a, an entertainment. And arriving means helping, and helping means to transform. They sell 27% of the food of Latin America. They are very powerful community. They are part of a market size close to, that's the base of the pyramid market, $700 billion. So they are very, very important for many, many actors of society. So based on this, really our objectives change. First, we thought that we needed to move from training them to understanding and listening to them, understanding their needs, from selling them more products to give them hope. And from asking them to how to sell more to really gain pride and dignity. So this is what makes us different with this program in SAP Miller. Uh, because we are focusing to sowing happy hearts and proud leaders that will allow us to have prosperity communities and a prosper prosperous society. We are empowering communities. Probably for you here, sitting here in Boston, it's not easy to understand who these people are. But let me tell you, they are very special. They are leaders. They are social agents. They are the models to follow of the young generations. But they are also facing a lot of challenges. They, they have limited uh, business skills, life skills, lack of access to finance and to technology. And they are informal. They um, have lack of license to operate. So through this process of RE, they are making the first steps to become formal. We are empowering leaders. Why are they leaders? Because they are the neighborhood watch. When a community is unsafe, they can take care of this neighborhood, not the police. They tell the parents what are they, the children doing and not doing. 
And when a parent comes with a child having a problem, there is a retailer to give them a hand. They also give them credit to this parent that need the money today for the breakfast tomorrow. They give the credit because the banks are far away. They are community leaders. Um, we have been running this program for two years in seven countries of Latin America. Um, 10,000 retailers have been benefited. Um, uh, an average of 13% of their sales have increased. This is because they are being more effective and more productive. And only 3% of them have quit the program. We thought it was going to be higher because they work almost 12 hours a day and they don't want to leave the shop. But through this process, they have learned the importance of having a balance and, uh, between their lives and their work and be more productive. They have also implemented 930 social projects. What is this? At the, at the fourth stage of the 4E program, <coughs> they learn how to become better leaders. So they start identifying needs of the community and working with the neighbors on projects that they can help them to be better um, in, in the community and have probably an additional income. So we, we've been doing this with many innovative projects. We found also five pillars or drivers of change. Basically, they are better business people, better members of family, better life conditions, better leaders, and better um, agents of social change, change for their communities. And as I said before, we cannot this, 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 do this alone. Um, I want to take the opportunity today to thank the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, because of this, he, their contribution of $3 million grant for this program. And also to Fundes, uh, who have been our partners since the beginning, co-creating and designing this program. Uh, we need partners. We need your help. We need your talent. 4E is a, it's an open platform. It's already tested. It can be replicated anywhere in, in the world. We need partners from the technology sector, from the banking sector. We need the governments. We, we need many, many actors that have the same purpose. We, we think that this million of retailers helping a lot of families to overcome poverty and to be sustainable is one of the ways to achieve social and economic impact. And this is why I say prosperity and hope is here. And I invite you to change the world. Thank you. Good evening. I'm very excited to comment on these two papers. When I was invited, I thought, well, what, what do I know about retail stores? So it turns out we've been recently working in Chiapas at CID, and we've been doing in particular some productive dialogue pilots in indigenous poor communities of Chiapas that are somehow close to markets. And one of the few businesses that survives in these indigenous communities in Chiapas every now and then, and you get to see, is a store. So there's a small store with a lady inside, so we went there, interviewed them all, spent their two weeks, and then came back. So what we found out is that, well, they don't know anything about inventories. They don't know anything about distribution channels. So they just sell to whoever is around. They don't know how to reach to larger markets. They have no idea how to deal with suppliers. So basically, they buy whenever the suppliers stop by. If they think they need, otherwise, they let them go. And then when I came back and I presented this to Ricardo, we had all pictures and the diagrams. I remember him saying, well, we just found out that these people is exactly like us. <laughs> because we work here in Harvard, and we have no idea how Harvard sells their products. We have no idea on retail. How do they buy the desks, the classrooms? How do they put the whole thing up? How do they sell the No idea on inventories, if anything. So basically, it's exactly like them. We just know one thing, but we can function here as opposed to them. 
because there's an organization that put together all this knowledge, so we don't need to know that to function. And I found, and we found that's the key difference that differentiates that uh, as opposed to us. We know one thing, but we have people around us that know what we don't know. When I was reading these two proposals today, and that's the reason that I requested to have them together so I could comment on both, I was thinking precisely in this, because both proposals lack this approach that if this goes ahead, and we all care about inclusive growth, if we succeed, mo m most, most of these stores are gonna shut down. Like I'm from Venezuela, which is a country that has been brought down to ashes. 70% of the market is handled by small stores. And Marcela is from Bolivia, 65% of the market is handled by small stores. Brazil, between 40 or 60, but Chile, 20. So we do know that if we, as people that care about inclusive growth, we succeed, these stores are gonna shut down. And then the questions that I wanna pose to, to the both presenters, winners of our case study contest is, I would evaluate these initiatives to the extent that they prepare these people to jump up to the next level, as opposed to helping them to survive with a business model that we know is inefficient, but it's necessary. Like Marcella was saying, we all want a, a, a business in the corner. It's, it's not so much about convenience, it's about cash. When you read about this, what you find out is that when the frequency of salary is lower, you cannot do what most of us do, which is going to the supermarket once every 15 days. So we have our credit card, we put it there, we make this big shop, we go home. But if you have daily salaries, then you cannot afford to make a daily travel. And because of your lack of liquidity, you need to do these small buys, purchases, like the guy that sells you the cigarettes differentiated, which is a classic of these small towns. Well, that guy is breaking down that package and selling it to you. You don't have liquidity. So I was wondering as I was reading this, and it's the first time that I got to read about this in depth. Shouldn't we be working on the other end? Like these stores exist, and they will remain to exist for a while. These stores exist because there's a lack of liquidity on the other end. There's a lack of formal jobs and access to financial markets. So if we address that problem, which is the problem that actually makes necessary these small stores that are inefficient, then in that way we might be solving the problem in a different manner. So I just wanted to invite both of the winners to think about this and see what you come up with. Now the, the Boosie case, I really, I really like this, this idea. This is one of the ideas that we had in Chappas. Is there any way we can consolidate this? Is there any way we can create a platform where we put together all these people so they have bigger orders, so they have some negotiating power, so some margin is squeezed out of the wholesaler or the manufacturing to that end. And so I find that to be a beautiful idea, and I think it's an idea that can be part of a productivity gradually improvement so that these businesses are less efficient. And I also find in these ideas some merit to the extent that they prepare these people to jump up to the next stage. So what's the next stage? Well, we're not gonna have Walmarts in poor neighborhoods, but Walmart can break down and actually it's been doing that in Mexico into smaller stores. So you have the benefit of the convenience and the reach and also smaller packaging, but at the same time they offer you that they have all this business intelligence so they can get to you in a cheaper manner. So we have a great case study in Venezuela, which is the idea by a Harvard Business School graduate. And basically the idea is this 400 square meter store that gets into poor neighborhoods. So they offer the convenience, they negotiate the different packaging so that it's a smaller, so that people can buy smaller volumes. But at the same time, they have this huge business intelligence, these great distribution centers that take advantage of that. So, I talked to him yesterday as I preparing this, and he told me, well, I'm sad that everywhere I open, I know 10 small stores close. But at the same time, I know that I can sell cheaper than what they sell, because I know myself, I'm more efficient, I have a distribution manager, I have a logistic manager. So he has this type of specializations that these small stores are lacking. So the other idea, which is the idea of training retailers to be business owners and at some point getting in contact with the community and universities. And 
it's like trying to teach this guy the unteachable. Like we're trying to have this business store guy to be like the store guy, the inventory, the cashier, and even go to the university, relate, leader community, people have a problem, come to me. And what we do know at CID is that when the lower the development of the society, the more things that one person can, has to do. So, I mean, you cannot have this corporate social responsibility manager at the store. You can have that at Pemex, but Pemex is huge. So they have this guy among thousands that does that. So I will invite you, uh, I, I work at a brewery when, like porn stars say, when I was young and I badly needed the money. I work at a brewery in Venezuela. And we, we didn't go to the, to the length that the Catalina program goes. Like, but we did help the, the small stores with fridge. We helped them paint the whole thing to keep it nice. We have a great distribution network. But in the end, I remember those were the guys we sold more expensive to. Because their orders were small, their negotiating power was minimal. And we told them, we have to come here to sell you. But the truth is that we go there to sell him in the next corner another one. So we did have a good distribution system. But in the end, we helped him to survive so that we can keep on selling to him. So I cannot relate my experience to, to other countries' experience. But I do remember this, this very well. And I just wanted to invite the winners to think about this. Larry Sommer said yesterday uh, one sentence that I kept. Well, he said many. It's not that he was <laughs> short on ideas, but related to this. Small is beautiful, but, but big is potent. And potent is often associated to sustainable. So I also want to invite uh, the winners to think about this idea. Are we helping these people to transcend? Are we helping them to survive while the economy grows and their business model becomes totally unsustainable? Are we making them more secure from a financial standpoint? And if we are not, how can we possibly do that? And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>